A quiet night of quiet stars. Not hundreds, not thousands, but millions of years ago. An ancient moon showers the land with light. Below it, strange creatures, half ape, half man, make an ambitious play. They approach a recently deceased carcass to butcher it with their stone tools. The lions watch their every move, and the hyenas are on their way. How this encounter will play out is lost to the sands of time, but evident in the existence of you and I. Homo habilis was a very important human species. They pioneered the creation of stone tools and the exploitation of carcasses. Their brain was significantly larger and more complex than any other prior hominid. In a dangerous world full of predators, they survived to give way to all other human species. They were the first humans and deserve to be remembered as taking a decisive step in the evolution of you and I. The first remains of this species were discovered in 1959. However, the remains only consisted of a single molar and it was not known what species they may have belonged to. The first recognized remains were discovered a year later in Old Dubai Gorge, Tanzania. They consist of a partial juvenile skull, foot, and hand bones that date to 1.75 million years ago. Olduvai Gorge has long been a fruitful place to find Oldowan industry tools. For years, these tools were ascribed to Paranthropus Boise since it was known to have lived in the area. Now it seems there was a new, more human culprit who had been making these tools. The remains of OH7 were assigned to the genus Homo and given the species name Habilis, meaning handy, able, or skillful in Latin. The name Handyman became a common nickname. Though its classification of being included in the genus Homo was, and to some still is, controversial. Originally, its use of tools was used as a justification for its inclusion. Shortly after this, it was hotly debated if Habilis should be reclassified into Australopithecus africanus. This is because at the time it was thought that humans evolved in Asia and that this species was a derived Australopithecine rather than a human ancestor. The brain size was also smaller than what Wilfred Legros Clark proposed when considering the genus Homo. With more discoveries, Homo habilis began to become more widely accepted. In 1983, it was proposed Australopithecus was a direct ancestor of Paranthropus and habilis. The idea was that through cladogenesis, Australopithecus evolved into habilis, then to erectus, and then into modern humans. This is a generalized model that is still relatively true except for more intermediate species and evolutionary dead ends. This model was accepted and many late Pliocene and early Pleistocene hominid remains more archaic than erectus were classified as habilis. This practice caused the range in variation for the species to be quite large. This led to the creation of two terms to describe habilis, habilis senso stricto and habilis senso lato, or in English, habilis in the strict sense and habilis in the broad sense. Paleoanthropologists use this classification to understand the large variation we see through our rather fragmentary finds. Decades later, it is still widely accepted that the genus Homo evolved from Australopithecines in Africa. What remains unknown is when this split occurred and what was the first species of Homo. Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis are generally recognized as being at the base of the genus Homo. Habilis seems to be more primitive than rudolfensis. This strengthens the idea that it is the link between Australopithecines and the genus Homo. The oldest Homo specimen, LD350-1, dates all the way back to 2.8 million years ago. This is half a million years before the oldest known habilis specimen. However, it is thought that the habilis species may be a few hundred thousand years older than our oldest specimen. The partial mandible has been described as combining primitive traits seen in early Australopithecus with derived morphology observed in later Homo. 
The specimen may belong to the ancestor of Hablus, perhaps the true link between us and the Australopithecines. It could also be considered the same species as Hablus, though we do not currently have enough evidence to know. The mandible was found in East Africa. This tells us that Australopithecus afarensis or Garhi may have been its direct ancestor. It is also possible it evolved in the south from either Australopithecus africanus or Sediba. Another enigmatic question regarding Hablus and human evolution is whether Hablus is actually ancestral to Erectus or if it represents an offshoot on the human line. Currently, it is widely accepted to be an ancestor of all later species, including Rudolfensis, Erectus, and our own species. Erectus in particular coexisted with the species for at least a half a million years. This has caused some to question whether Erectus truly did come from Habilis. It is possible that a group of Habilis became reproductively isolated and this group developed into Erectus through anacladogenesis. Anacladogenesis is a form of speciation where an ancestral population retains its morphology while a population splits off and forms a new morphology. This process creates one new species and maintains the former. This is different than cladogenesis. Cladogenesis creates two new species. The speciation that occurred in Habilis brings us to an important note about human evolution. Basal and derived groups of hominins can live concurrently, or in simpler, less nuanced terms, more primitive and more advanced groups can live together in the same place at the same time. We see evidence for this in Habilis. The oldest known Habilis specimen, AL666-1, dates to 2.3 million years ago, though it is anatomically more derived than the younger OH7 specimen. Not more derived than all Habilis specimens, but it is still notable that it is more advanced than OH7. This is not very surprising. Africa is a large place and groups of Habilis would have been geographically isolated for hundreds of thousands of years. We see this today in the genetic differences between modern groups of chimpanzees. Lower Pleistocene Africa would have been a place of many ape species. Australopithecines, Paranthropus, Habilis, various evolutionary dead ends, and also the ancestors of modern African apes. It would have been fascinating to see all the apes interact with each other. You could imagine violent encounters over territory or even harmonious assimilation. Homo habilis is known to have had a fairly large range. We know that it lived across southern and east Africa, but it may have expanded its range much further. Based on 2.1 million year old tools from Changchen, China, habilis or an ancestral species may have dispersed across Asia. Further evidence can be found in its descendants, Erectus. The earliest Erectus can be found in both Africa and East Asia. They may have been in China as early as 2.1 million years ago. Their appearance here is surprising and could be explained by an early dispersal of derived habilis. No remains of them have been found outside of Africa, so we do not currently know. Understanding the place of habilis in the picture of human evolution is very hard to do. We have very limited remains of the species that are also very fragmentary. Future discoveries will certainly change how we view this hominin. Homo habilis would have appeared quite primitive to us. It had a protruding jaw, small brain, awkward gait, and it was likely covered in hair. It was still much more human-like than its predecessors. One very important aspect about its evolution was a larger brain. Australopithecines have a brain size between 300 and 500 cubic centimeters. They average slightly over 400 cubic centimeters. The brain size of Habilis range between 500 and 800 cubic centimeters. OH7 has a brain volume between 730 and 830 cubic centimeters. This is over 40% larger than the average Australopithecine. This is very significant. 
However, overall brain size isn't everything. How a brain is organized is just as or even more important than total volume. From casts of the brain, we can see an increased bulk of frontal and parietal lobes. This is a derived feature of HOMA. The sucal and gyral pattern of the lateral part of the frontal lobe differs from Australopithecines and resembles HOMO. There may also be evidence that Habilis was right-handed. Handedness is associated with major reorganization of the brain and lateralization of brain function between hemispheres. The pattern of striations on the teeth of OH65 slanting right may have been accidentally self-inflicted when the individual was pulling a piece of meat with its teeth in the left hand while trying to cut it with a stone tool using the right hand. This evidence is not concrete but still very relevant. Overall, the shape and size of their brain is enough for many to designate the species as belonging to the genus Homo. Along with a larger brain, we see smaller jaws and teeth. As the trend in human evolution goes, brains get bigger and jaws get smaller. Habilis followed this trend, though they were still quite primitive. The tooth rows of Habilis were V-shaped as opposed to the U-shaped jaws of later Homo. Their mouth was also very prognathic, meaning it jutted outwards. Though we do see the precursors for future facial developmental patterns, especially that the face was flat from the nose up. These trends would continue to the very human face of Erectus and eventually to our own virtually flat faces. Besides their heads, their postcranial remains are interesting, though they are very fragmentary and in turn have provided endless debate. We do know that Habilis was smaller than more derived species like Erectus. Specimen OH62 was estimated to have been between 100 and 120 centimeters tall. It would have weighed 20 to 37 kilograms. These estimations are quite wide because again, our remains are very fragmentary. Habilis may have been much taller than estimated. If we assume longer, more human-like legs, OH62 would have been about 148 centimeters tall or 4 foot 10 inches. This is a very important point about this species. There are generally two schools of thought regarding its stature. They may have had short legs with long ape-like arms and an ape-like posture or longer, more human-like legs. Its stature and leg length would tell us how well adapted this species was to walking long distances or climbing trees. Unfortunately, we only have two species with postcranial evidence regarding this question. Some anthropologists have argued that because the humerus to femur ratio of OH62 is within the range of variation for modern humans, and KNMER375 is close to the modern human average, it is unsafe to assume ape-like proportions. The femur has been traditionally compared to Australopithecus afarensis specimens, but this comparison may be inaccurate. The femur of Erectus or Ergaster may be more accurate for comparison. Since we do not have a good measure for the length of the limb bones, it is much better to look at the cross-section of the bones. The thickness of limb bones in OH62 is more similar to chimpanzees than Erectus or Gaster or even modern humans. This may indicate different load-bearing capabilities more suitable for arborality in Homo habilis. In addition, the strong fibula of OH35 is more like that of non-human apes and consistent with arborality and vertical climbing. The remains of OH8, which is a foot, is better suited for terrestrial movement than the foot of Australopithecus afarensis. However, it does still retain many ape-like features consistent with climbing. Interestingly, the foot has a projected toe bone and compacted midfoot joint structures, which restrict rotation between the foot and ankle as well as at the front of the foot. Foot stability enhances the efficiency of force transfer between the leg and the foot and vice versa, and may have helped generate energy while running but not walking. This could possibly indicate that Homo habilis was capable of some degree of endurance running. Endurance running was only thought to have evolved later in Erectus sergaster. We may be seeing a transition to this method of locomotion. 
further evidence of its lifestyle can come from its hands. The hands of OH7 suggest precision gripping, dexterity, as well as adaptations for climbing. Overall, the postcranial remains provide an odd combination of terrestrial and arboreal adaptations. This perhaps should be expected considering its place in human evolution. They would have been good climbers, but possibly even efficient runners. A good combination of traits for avoiding predators. With future discoveries, we may be able to answer these questions with certainty. For now, we are left hypothesizing and debating. It is important to note that this species exhibited considerable sexual dimorphism. Sexual dimorphism is a condition that sexes of the same species exhibit different characteristics. The degree of sexual dimorphism can give us an understanding of male and female roles in their communities. Generally in humans and other apes, size is the main difference between sexes. In modern humans, on average, adult men are 9% taller and 16% heavier than adult women. However, when we look back in human evolution, we see a much larger size discrepancy. Australopithecine males were often twice the size of the females. Since habilis existed at such an early time in human evolution, it is hypothesized males would have been significantly larger than females. Identifying males from females from very fragmentary finds is very difficult. In this species, we have been able to identify males and females, but so far estimates regarding the difference in size between the sexes remains enigmatic. However, it is safe to assume males would have been larger because it is the case in earlier Australopithecines and later Homo erectus. Let's take a break from the video to talk about today's sponsor, NordVPN, which currently offers 70% off a two-year plan plus an additional month for free just for the price of a cup of coffee. NordVPN secures your online data and provides an array of benefits that are essential in the modern day. Firstly, Nord protects your data. Most people do not realize how vulnerable their online accounts are. Hackers can read your emails, steal passwords, and even get your login info. Nord also hides your location. I can't tell you how many times I was playing Black Ops 2 and then some trash talk led to the city I live in being read out in the chat. Not only can this be scary, but also dangerous. Besides protection, NordVPN can also let you access content that might not be available where you live. From sites such as Netflix and many others, you can access movies, TV series, and documentaries from all around the world. Also, if you read academic research often, you can get access to papers. A lot of times when I'm researching for these videos, I visit sites that only let me read one article a day. But with NordVPN, I can read as much as I want. I use Nord to set my location to Italy. This not only protects me, but I am also learning Italian, so all the ads I get on YouTube are a little extra language practice. Nord has thousands of servers in 60 different countries and is available on every major platform. Go to nordvpn.com north02 to get a two-year plan plus one additional month with a huge discount. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Again, the link can be found in the description. Now let's get back to the video. Early hominins including habilis and even erectus are thought to have had much more hair than modern humans. So much so that it might have resembled the fur seen on other non-human ape species such as chimpanzees. We do not know the extent of this fur as there is no physical evidence. A light covering with skin peeking through is probable. A dense covering as seen in chimpanzees is possible. It is thought hairlessness in humans appeared in Erectus and Ergaster species. Our best guess is that Habilis was a step between Australopithecines and Erectus. It is unfortunate that we do not know what their fur would have looked like, but it also gives us room to consider other possibilities. Who knows, maybe Habilis sported interesting and elaborate patterns colorful males and bland females. Considering other ape species and modern humans, this is unlikely but certainly possible. Habilis was a meat eater, though it rarely actually hunted its game. It is theorized that it derived meat from scavenging. 
it may have acted as a confrontational scavenger, a type of scavenger that scares other predators away from their kills. Smaller predators such as jackals or cheetahs may have been targeted. Though habilis were not large animals, even a relatively small group would have been very intimidating for smaller animals. It is likely they also carried weapons and tools to make them appear more intimidating and to actually butcher the carcass. We do have plenty of hand axes that they produced. These tools could have been used in close combat or even as projectiles. Regular rocks may have also been quite effective projectiles. A group of 10 habilis throwing a handful of baseball-sized rocks could even be fatal to a medium-sized predator. Even larger predators like lions could be deterred this way. Some anthropologists have hypothesized that throwing may have actually been a very important aspect of our offense and defense during this time. Habilis was not the best thrower, however, it could still create considerable force while throwing. Besides projectiles, large sticks or bones could have been used. A large stick or bone could do considerable damage and also aid in intimidation. Habilis may have even manufactured primitive spears. Evidence for wooden spears would not appear until much, much later. Even chimpanzees are aware of the idea of sharpening a stick to impale game animals. Chimps make their spears by simply biting the end of a stick to create a sharp end. Habilis could have done the same. But Habilis was much more cognitively advanced than a chimp. They could have sharpened their spears with their stone tools or simply scraped the wood on an abrasive rock until sharp. Their use of spears is purely speculative but worth considering. Confrontational scavenging is risky but surprisingly still practiced by some humans to this day. The Maasai people of East Africa are known to intimidate a whole pride of lions with as little as three people. This takes enormous confidence to pull off and it is unlikely Havlis would have been able to overcome their instincts this boldly. Instead, ape-like intimidation techniques such as screaming, throwing, and arm waving would have been likely used. It is also possible that Havlis did not even need to ward any predators off. After observing that lions in Kenya's Old Pajita Conservancy leave a large amount of their kill intact, paleoanthropologist Brianna Pobener hypothesized in a 2015 paper that saber-toothed cats living alongside Habilis may have killed and consumed their prey in a similar way, leaving plenty of leftover food for hungry hominids. From a zebra that lions had eaten, Pobener found that 95% of the bones were abandoned with some meat on them. Hardly any of the bones had been licked clean. 50% of the bones had significant amounts of meat left. It was estimated an entire zebra carcass could yield almost 15 kilograms of meat. Some of the meat that was left by the lions was in hard to reach places between bones. Habilis could have used tools to access this meat. It is hypothesized that one already eaten zebra could provide over 60,000 calories. This would have met the daily requirements of about 27 early hominins. This is only if no other scavengers got to the carcass first. Various scavengers are able to process a carcass quite fast. Habilis would have been able to scare away most scavengers like jackals and birds. Though hyenas would have been a significant threat to their safety. However, as observed at Kenya's Volpagita Conservancy, Scavengers such as hyenas are not everywhere. Here lions eat the carcass and only smaller carnivores come to eat the rest. This situation would favor the exploitation of carcasses by habilis. Throughout other hominin species such as Neanderthals and our own, because of competition, hyenas tend to inhabit different areas than us. Habilis may have intentionally avoided the range of hyenas in their area. Another aspect of scavenging carcasses is the bone marrow. Bone marrow is extremely nourishing. As opposed to wild game meat, it is fatty and packed with essential nutrients. Other animals like hyenas and wild dogs can crack bones and access the marrow, but some bones are just too hard to crack. 
Luckily for our ancestors, using a large rock to smash bones is more powerful than any carnivore molar. Even in the worst case scenarios when all the meat was stripped from a carcass and most of the bones were not to dust by scavengers, a carcass would have still provided habilis with calories. A part of the carcass that hardly any scavenger can access is the brain. In Kanjera, Kenya, early humans transported not only limb bones, but also the isolated remains of the heads of larger prey animals. They then broke them open and consumed their brains. There is also evidence of direct predation of juvenile gazelles. These young animals were probably simply caught by hand or killed with a weapon prior to capture. For the entirety of the existence of Habilis, they obtained meat through these fairly simple ways. It wouldn't be until Erectus that humans began to hunt larger game animals. But it is fascinating how they were able to access so much meat in such creative and unexploited ways. This is perhaps one of the keys to their success as a species. They weren't the fastest or the strongest, but they were able to use that big brain to exploit their environment in a way that other animals couldn't. This change in diet is also hypothesized to have led to an increase in brain size. Acquiring meat may have put evolutionary pressure on developing enhanced cognitive skills to facilitate strategic scavenging of fresh carcasses. Meat may have allowed the large and calorie-expensive ape gut to decrease in size, allowing this energy to be diverted to brain growth. Based on dental microwear texture analysis, Homo habilis likely did not regularly consume tough foods. Microwear texture complexity on average is somewhere between that of tough food eaters and leaf eaters. This points to an increasingly generalized and omnivorous diet. This could also indicate a higher consumption of meat as well as further processing of food with tools. Fruit was also likely a very important dietary component indicated by dental erosion consistent with repetitive exposure to acidity. Besides just fruit, a lot of other, less tough plants would have been consumed. Homo habilis lived in a prehistoric hell. Weighing only about 30 pounds, they are susceptible to all sorts of predators. In a time of darkness, when brains were small and tools were primitive, our ancestors often became prey. Despite having very fragmentary remains of this species, we do have a surprising amount of evidence that they were preyed upon. We have two separate remains found in close proximity that show evidence of crocodile attacks. The foot of OH8 was bitten by a crocodile. What species of croc, we do not know for sure. It was likely a Nile crocodile, but it may have been the monstrous Crocodilus anthropophagus. This animal was nearly a meter longer than the largest modern crocodile ever recorded. Not only would Anthropophagus appear like a dinosaur to us, it must have seemed like a goliath to the small habilis of the area. Both Nile crocodiles and Anthropophagus prowled Oldovay Gorge for habilis's entire existence. The remains of OH8 and OH35 are both from the left leg of two separate Homo habilis individuals. They were found only 200 meters away from each other, leading to speculation that they were of the same individual. It was then found that they are around 10,000 years apart in age. In addition to crocodile bite marks, OH35 also had the bite marks of a leopard on it. This poor soul fell victim to two predators likely on the same day. He was perhaps caught by a leopard and then a crocodile pulled him into the water. Or the croc may have attacked him, leaving him wounded for a leopard to finish the job. Our evidence of predation does not stop there. We also have a parietal skull bone and jawbone with bite marks of a leopard on it. These remains can give you a picture of just how dangerous Old Vey Gorge would have been around 2 million years ago. We hardly have any remains of this species, but three of them have direct evidence of predation. Leopards and crocodiles were not the only animals they had to worry about. 
The ancestors of modern lions have lived in Tanzania and all over Africa since the early Pleistocene. Just as they still kill people to this day, they likely preyed on our ancestors. But perhaps an even more deadly predator was Dinophilus. This animal was between a leopard and a lion in size. It had very robust forelimbs and saber teeth. It has been suggested that it was a specialized hominin hunter. These claims seem to be unsubstantiated, but that does not mean it didn't eat the occasional habilis. Big cats in general are very good at killing hominins. They are stealthy, powerful, and able to kill us quickly. The ancestors of wild dogs and hyena species may have also ganged up to kill our ancestors. The extinct Chasma porthetes, also known as the hunting hyena, may have been a particular problem for Habilis. Other seemingly peaceful animals would have been very dangerous to our ancestors. Hippopotami may have been just as deadly as crocodiles at Oldovoy and other wetland environments. They are known in the modern day to be the deadliest animals in Africa. With ridiculously powerful jaws full of teeth and tusks, one bite could prove fatal for any hominin. Contrary to what you might think, they are not slow either. Usain Bolt cannot even outrun a hippopotamus at full speed. Our ancestors also encountered hippopotamus gorgops. At as much as 4,500 kilograms, it was twice the weight as the average modern hippo. They certainly would have appeared as behemoths. Large proboscideans could have also been quite dangerous to our ancestors. Dinotherium and Paleoloxodon reci were both much larger than modern elephants. Bull elephants are known to even kill rhinos when upset. If these beasts had a short temper like their relatives, then all Hablis could do is watch as they went on a rampage. Perhaps the most terrifying animal that these early humans could have come across was Dinopithecus. Dinopithecus were very similar to modern baboons except for their massive size. Some mature males weighed up to 77 kilograms and were 1.5 meters tall. That would be over twice the weight of even the biggest Hablis. One could only imagine the uncanny hell of running into one of these beasts. Their ferocious temper and massive fangs would have not only made them scary, but also very deadly. Imagine a troop of Dinopithecus wandering into your family's camp in the middle of the night. Looking up and seeing the ungodly silhouette of a dog-faced ape with teeth as long as knives. Now we cannot say for certain that Hablis interacted with these animals often, but modern, much smaller baboons are known to be very aggressive and even attack humans. If Dinopithecus acted anything like their very close relatives, then our ancestors may have had to be very careful around these horrors. Let's all take a moment to appreciate the dreadful times our ancestors had to endure. Besides predators, it is important to remember that Hablis was not the only other bipedal hominin in its range. Throughout time, the species coexisted with Homo rudolfensis, Homo ergaster, later more derived Homo erectus, and even Paranthropus boise. It is unknown how all these species interacted. Being so anatomically similar, these species likely exhibited niche partitioning the process by which natural selection drives competing species into different patterns of resource use or entirely different niches. Though from dental remains it seems these species had similar diets, all four of these species may have found each other in conflict over territory and resources. Paranthropus boise was a species of Australopithecine that coexisted with Hablis for the entirety of its existence. It was technologically much more primitive than Hablis, and it is not believed to have manufactured tools. Despite this, remains are associated with Oldowan tools. Leakey and colleagues when describing Homo Hablis suggested that one possibility was that Paranthropus boise was killed by Hablis, perhaps as food. However, when describing Paranthropus boise five years later, Louis Leakey said, 
There is no reason whatsoever in this case to believe that the skull represents the victim of a cannibalistic feast by some hypothetically more advanced type of man. Boise's association with Oldowan tools may either be a coincidence, or they may have found and used tools produced by Habilis. Whatever the case, it is fascinating to imagine how these species would have interacted. Though so similar and so human, their interactions were in all likelihood not friendly. We must remember that humans intellectually grew from this world. The countless encounters, good and bad, shape every human to this day. We are the descendants of an incomprehensively long line of people who have been through it all. Homo habilis is associated with the early Stone Age Oldowan tool industry. They created very simple tools primarily to butcher animals and crush bones. They also use some of their tools to work wood and process plants. Their tools are very simple, but they were still very advanced for the time. Knappers carefully selected lithic cores and knew that some rocks would break in specific ways. They preferred rocks that could break with a conchoidal fracture. Conchoidal fractures occur when a hard but brittle material is struck at a specific angle. This creates sharp and hard edges which are useful for tools. Though they were selective in their material, they often used what was at their disposal rather than searching far and wide. For example, spheroids are common at Old of Way which feature an abundance of large and soft quartz and quartzite pieces, whereas Kubi 4 lacks spheroids and provides predominantly hard basalt lava rocks. With such simple technology, they created several different tools, including choppers, polyhedrons, and discoids. Most early Oldowan tools did not require planning or foresight as opposed to later Oldowan tools. Complexity would not drastically increase until the appearance of Erectus. The Oldowan stone tool industry dates back to 2.6 million years ago and is perhaps associated with the evolution of our genus. This date is important. As mentioned earlier, the oldest habilis remains date back to 2.3 million years ago. However, it is hypothesized that the species may be a few hundred thousand years older than our oldest remains. The creation of these tools may be directly correlated with habilis diverging from its Australopithecine predecessors. Australopithecines also made tools as far back as 3.3 million years ago. This is known as the Lomaqui tool industry. Nonetheless, the sharp edges of Oldowan tools were a major innovation from Australopithecine technology. These tools would have allowed them to more efficiently process food. This would have been very helpful during the period of climate change they endured during this time. There is currently no solid evidence to suggest this species used fire. We do not have any harsh or burnt animal remains at their sites. There is some evidence of controlled use of fire going back to the dusk of their existence, but this was likely from Erectus. They certainly encountered fire on many occasions, as wildfires are common. They may have scavenged animals killed by these fires and had a primitive understanding of what was going on. You can only imagine how otherworldly and magical fire must have seemed to these people. Another technology they may have used are constructed dwellings, or in other words, shelter. Shelter itself is not a very complex concept. Many animals create shelters and some are even very complex. But hominin shelters differ in a number of ways than typical animal shelters. In 1962, a circle made with volcanic rocks was discovered in Oldovoy Gorge. At specific intervals, rocks were piled up to 20 centimeters high. Anthropologists have suggested the rock piles were used to support poles stuck into the ground. They may have possibly supported a windbreak or a rough hut. Some modern-day nomadic tribes build similar low-lying rock walls to build temporary shelters upon, bending upright branches as poles and using grasses or animal hide as a screen. The site dates to 1.75 million years ago and is attributed to early Homo. It is the oldest claimed evidence of architecture. Whether the structure belonged to Erectus or Habilis, we may never know. 
this species probably did not wear clothes of any sort. They lived in a warm habitat and their hair was likely enough to keep them warm at night. It is possible simple items were worn such as an untreated piece of leather, but this is very speculatory. The first clothing technology would likely appear in Erectus as they moved into colder climates. Homo habilis may have been far from having a language, but still may have communicated in a way that was much more complex than modern non-human apes. They had a distinguishable brocus area that is correlated with language in modern humans. Still, they likely did not even have a proto-language, but may have been capable of rudimentary speech. The social structure of ancient humans is an incredibly hard topic to study, but nonetheless essential to our understanding of our ancestors. Typically, Erectus ergaster is considered to have been the first human to have lived in a monogamous society. All other hominins preceding this species are thought to have been polygamous. This is mainly based on the degree of sexual dimorphism and the size disparity between the sexes. Basically, smaller females and larger males generally indicates a polygamous society, while males and females of similar size indicate a monogamous society. This assertion is based on the general trends seen in modern primates and humans. However, there are two issues with this hypothesis. The correlation between sexual dimorphism and societal layout is not direct and there are exceptions. The other issue is that we struggle to identify the true degree of sexual dimorphism in ancient remains. In some cases, sex is arbitrarily determined in large part based on perceived size and apparent robustness in the absence of more reliable elements in sex identification such as the pelvis. In Habilis, the enlarged cheek teeth would suggest marked size-related dimorphism and thus intense male-to-male -male conflict over mates and a polygamous society. However, the small canines indicate the opposite. The problem is that they possess a mosaic of traits not seen in modern apes or humans. This prevents us from accurately comparing them to any modern animal. Besides their skeletons, their tools can actually tell us a lot about their society. The spatial distribution of tools and processed remains at sites in Old Way Gorge indicate that the area was used as communal butchering and eating grounds. This is a contrast from the nuclear family system of modern hunter-gatherers where the group is subdivided into smaller units, each with their own butchering and eating grounds. This indicates a lack of complexity in their society more in par with that of non-human apes. The behavior of habilis groups is sometimes modeled after that of savanna chimps and baboons. These communities survive on the open savanna by having several males for defense. These males typically engage in throwing sticks and stones against enemies and predators. In 1993, paleoanthropologists and psychologists estimated that habilis group size ranged from 70 to 85 members. This is on the upper end of chimp and baboon group size. Habilis groups most likely needed fairly high numbers in order to ward off predators. Savanna chimps may be the best modern example of how our ancestors evolved. Given enough time, perhaps they would follow the other trends our ancestors went through. Homo habilis would go extinct 1.65 million years ago. It is not very hard to understand why. Homo erectus was the next hominid in line for dominance. There are two schools of thought regarding their extinction. The habilis species more or less as a whole through anagenesis may have gradually advanced into the more derived erectus. Odovoy bed 1 has habilis at the bottom, then hominins with a mixture of habilis and erectus traits, and then finally erectus at the top. Other remains from various sites corroborate this hypothesis. However, in other sites we see that habilis and erectus coexisted for hundreds of thousands of years. This would suggest anacladogenesis. As mentioned earlier, anacladogenesis is the process by which a sister taxa diverges from an ancestral lineage while the ancestral lineage retains its morphology. The split between erectus and habilis was likely a result of geographical isolation or niche partitioning, though likely a combination of both. 
Geographical isolation occurs when populations are physically separated. In the case of Habilis and Erectus, Erectus became further adapted to living in the open while Habilis retained its tree climbing ability. Though they are found in the same area, their initial split could have been caused by this reason. Erectus may have actually evolved in Eurasia before migrating back into Africa, but African remains are very close in age and no definite conclusions can currently be made. Whatever the case, they coexisted for about a half a million years. Their ultimate extinction was likely due to increasing dominance of Erectus. Their technology was becoming better and they were overall better hominins. They had bigger and more complex brains, a body adapted for open plains, and many other more derived traits. A change in climate may have also put a stress on both species, leading to increased competition. Just as Homo sapiens would go on to replace every other hominin, Erectus would replace the archaic forms of its world. Overall, Habilis is a much more important species than many may realize. It pioneered the creation of tools and the exploitation of carcasses. Its brain was also significantly larger and more complex than any other prior hominid. Though our postcranial remains are limited, we know the body of Habilis was also following the trends that would make us human. They were the first humans and deserve to be remembered as taking a decisive step in the evolution of you and I. Thanks for watching the sixth installment in the Ancient Humans series. This video has honestly been a pleasure to make. I feel like I have really hit my stride while making this video. I have gotten much better at using sources effectively and working on longer projects. I am writing this before I actually have to edit the video, so I might have a different opinion after. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed watching and there's plenty more content on the way. But how many ancient humans are really left? Well, there are a good five that are not a subdivision of Erectus, but a lot of them don't have that much information to really talk about. I do want to cover Naledi next, but I might wait a bit to make that video. Some future topics I am thinking about are Stone Age weapons, which is already completely written, the Orignation culture, the Clovis culture, cargo cults, and maybe even Easter Island. Let me know what you think about these topics and give me some new ideas down below. I guess I should use this time to talk about some other things regarding the channel. Well, as mentioned in the last Ancient Human epilogue, I am going to be creating some stock footage of Neanderthals for a future project. I of course have to make a very high quality costume for this project. I'm currently tanning two deer hides my uncle killed this year to serve as part of the costume. Neanderthals did hunt a lot of deer, so it's pretty accurate. I also still need to mount some Neanderthal spearheads for the video. I might make a second channel to show me making these props. Let me know what you think about that. Well, besides that, I am happy to kind of announce that I am working with a professor from a prominent university on a future project. I've been trying to do this for a while, and I think I got it figured out, but you guys will not see this project for a very long time, so be patient. So overall, I just wanted to say that there's a lot of stuff in the works. The quality takes time, and the final product of this project will truly be something special. Check out these stone points I just got from a friend. Two of them are knives, and the other two are projectile points. He also sent with him the flutes that were attached to the points, so I'm going to use these for a project I'm making on the Clovis people. I think it's actually going to be a really long video, probably similar to the length of this one, about 40 minutes, so let me know about your thoughts on that. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe, it really helps out the channel. Check out my Instagram and comment some video ideas down below. I make videos about history of humans, ancient animals, and the occasional full-length documentary. If that sounds interesting, check out the over 100 videos I have made. Well, I'll see you on the next episode of Northo 2. See ya.